Hey, Moose. <laughs> hey. <clears throat> well, I actually put a big effort in for the first hour of light. <laughs> I fished one, two, three spots in this one run beside me. Didn't mess with the camera or anything. Actually tried. Changed my rig three different times and uh, nothing yet. That's the way it goes with steelhead fishing. They definitely don't jump on like hungry trout. I'll tell you what. But it's fun and healthy, right? And uh, the day's just begun. I did bring my underwater camera. You know, the most, the majority of the time I've been fishing this year so far, I've just been concentrating on filming. I love filming stuff. So, I'm, I'm a few days away from going on my next week-long steelhead tour on Vancouver Island again. And things should be a little different. Although, I really do want to film underwater too. I got a big craving to do that. I love doing that. But anyway, I'm going to share some emails, give the, the water a little bit of a break, and uh, then carry on upriver and see if I can't find something else. And it's funny, I saw a video posted, I don't know where it was posted, social media, and somebody got real lucky and they took photographs of some black wolves chasing elk in the water right here, right behind me. Last year, I think, in the wintertime. I mean, keep my eyes peeled. It sure would be frickin' cool to film something like that, wouldn't it? But anyway, let's have a look at what's going on in the email department today. Which there's never shortage of. And, uh... Oh. This is a big email. Well, I'm gonna read it anyway. And just so you guys know, um... Hold on a minute, just so you know. Uh, book two. Book two's coming out in three weeks to a month, I think. A month latest. And the second book is going to come out, which will make its way around the planet and lay on coffee tables for them all to read forever. And they'll be able to stop it, or take it away, make it disappear, right? 
So that's a good thing. For any of you that makes angry, well, oh well, you're gonna have to live with that yourself, I guess. What did I just put on my glasses? Yeah, so the second book's coming up. I think it's gonna be called The Day Sasquatch Became Real for Us. It might change, but I kinda doubt it. And I'll let you, I'll keep you all informed about the progress of that one. It's gonna be a little different than the first one, but it's gonna help a lot of people. Also, so what do we got? The title of this is Yosemite was was scared Yosemite was scared for my life all right during my life I had two encounters that I can't explain one was a shadow figure the other is an invisible creature that was breaking branches like a Sasquatch but could only be seen by my border collie both my wife and I could not see it but we could hear it we were in a fighting stance prepared to defend our lives this happened in Groveland California in about 2008 That'd be creepier than hell, man. The shadow figure sighting was in Brandonton, Florida at 3503 14th Street West. That was my childhood home. I've questioned the sighting since sixth grade. I don't understand how a full-grown man could be in solid black mist yet transparent. I can't understand how it walked through one wall and out the other. During this time, my radio, while off, would play voices that I could not make out all night long. I used to tell myself this must have been ham radio operator's transmission, but in hindsight, I don't really know. My mother had deep psychological issues that crippled her in her life, and I often questioned if she was tormented by something other than, dep- other than depression. This is just speculation, but I wonder if what I saw was somehow attached to her. I know it sounds crazy. However, that shadow figure left my house in the exact same direction my mother drove off in. And the shadow figure never even looked at me. It was focused on the direction it was walking in. I get how strange this is, but it happened. Next. So I'm a surfer who has traveled and lived outdoors for years and outside the US. My wife, Maverick, and I were just on just a little walk near, I believe, Camp Mather. We were between Camp Mather and a Thousand Trails campground on a road. And Maverick, our border collie, locked onto something across the river and up a hill, about 50 to 100 yards away. So Maverick clearly saw something because he started growling. He then stepped in front of my wife, blocking her from the direction of the perceived threat. Maverick then signaled to my wife to run. He did this by making eye contact with my wife and moving his head quickly in the direction he wanted to run. My wife started to run and I yelled stop. But both my wife and I knew exactly what Maverick was saying. I could not risk separation until I had analyzed the threat. My fear was the predator may use this tactic to divide the herd. So I'm scanning the ridge and I can see nothing, but I hear many loud tree breaks like a moose running through a thick forest. But I never see anything, even when I'm looking exactly at the location my dog was fixed on. Man, we were scared for our lives. After a few minutes protecting my wife, I was in a fighting pose, hands up and in boxing posture, one leg back. I was thinking that we were going to be attacked at any moment. And looking in the direction of the threat, I knew we needed to move. So I had us walk backward down the road until we were near the camp and then we ran like hell. Never saw anything. We need to understand Maverick our Border Collie is not unfamiliar with the mountains. In fact, we lived in the Indian Peaks wilderness for five years off-grid and traveled frequently. Maverick never reacted to any animal the way he did that day. We lived near Este Park, Colorado, and Maverick spent time around lots of deer, buffalo, elk, moose, fox, cattle, goats, bear, and wolf. He never reacted to a large bear on this property. In fact, once he had a bear steal his food, Maverick and I walked right up to the bear, 10 feet or so, as I yelled, and Maverick looked the other way like nothing was there. And that was on his property. So for Maverick to react the way he did in Groveland was completely out of the character. We ran back to our fifth wheel and never went back. 12 years now. I don't know what it was, but I know it was strong enough to plow through trees. And yes, I've heard black bear walk through the tree branches, and yes, they can be a little noisy. However, the volume of the tree breaks that day was so loud, like a truck plowing through the forest, or a large moose. But never did see anything, and never have I been so afraid. I'm out of my my mountain bike frequently. I'm not afraid because I know whatever it was, was clearly powerful enough to end our lives if it was so inclined. So it was clearly trying to scare us off. I do, however think about this incident often please don't mention my wife on your show her job is a bit high profile and norwood 
Wow. Yeah, that's a uh, that experience is gonna scare the crap out of anybody. I haven't had anything like that remotely close to that happen to me with something I can't see scaring the shit out of me close to me. And uh, for all of you out there, if there's anything you don't want me to mention in the video, in sharing your email, please tell me right off the bat. Make that your very first sentence, all right? If you don't want me to mention a name or a location or a, a road or whatever, tell me right away in the beginning of the, of the email, okay? Because obviously as I get going, I'm reading away and it might turn into a great big long story and it might be a real crazy attention grabber that makes your brain go off and I absolutely forget that. And then at the very end, oh yeah, and then at the very end of the video, or the email after read it all, then you say, oh, please don't share my name or whatever. And that could possibly screw me up later on and it might get edited in or, or left in by accident, okay? So make sure you guys do that. And thank you for sharing that with the world through me. Many people are gonna appreciate it without a doubt. And uh, it'll for sure hopefully help somebody understand that they're not going nuts, all right? Answers to some questions you may have. Steve, I really enjoy the forum you've o you have opened up here. Your simple candid demeanor is refreshing. It has also opened my eyes to the reality of how many people have had these encounters with these beings. This is the second time I've written you, and I thought maybe I can help you and some of your listeners glean some knowledge from my experiences. I'll try to keep this as short and to the point as I can, because I know your time is precious. I'm not a hunter. I have no issues with it at all. I've always loved to fish, and I always tried to get to places where no one is around to do it. I'm an avid bird watcher, a nature lover in general, and I'm well versed in the wildlife that is around me be it insects, reptiles, or the more mainstream things. I live in a Midwestern state that you've mentioned that has very large white-tailed deer. This state is not known for its forests as much as it is for its cornfields. What woodlands we have here are fragmented and seem to be limited to the various river bottoms that crisscross the state. This is what makes it easier to locate these Sasquatch beings much easier. They do not have the ability to just move back into more wilderness. Because of that, their behaviors related to us are very different. They are much more quiet and elusive when they have to live near large populations of our people. I do not want to go into too much detail as to how I acquired all this understanding simply because it is such a very long story. I do not expect anyone to believe me, but I ask anyone who hears my words to just file it away in the back of their mind. This is what I did and it prepared me for what I was eventually kept to come my way. Like I mentioned before in a previous email, I'm one of those people who sought them out. I did so because of something I experienced in 2000. I became obsessed at finding out the answer. After 20 years of boots on the ground, this is where I went. I first thought they were apes, then I discovered they are a type of people, as we define people. I then eventually came to understand that there is a paranormal aspect to them. Now hear me out. I was one of those people who would bully other people for thinking these things had some type of paranormal paranormal aspect to them. I was a huge jerk to so many people who spoke this stuff, and that has changed. I've eaten a big plate of crow, and I've had to apologize to many people. What caused this paradigm shift, may you ask? Personal experience. After a strange set of circumstances, I managed to become friends with someone who had these beings coming to their home on a regular basis. I was able to witness this paranormal aspect of the Sasquatch unfold over the course of two years as they visited this person's home just about nightly. I actually saw one jump out of the cornfield with my thermal camera, so I knew I was not being hoaxed. This whole ordeal unfolded over the course of two years, and it changed how I see the world. So here's what I want you and your audience to know. Mind speak, telepath, telepathy, spirit talk, whatever you want to call it, is real with these beings. If it is real and you managed to befriend a few who trusted you, what would you ask them? What would they ask you? Think about that. Imagine making contact and being able to communicate with a race of people we know nothing about. So let me try to explain a little of this to you. I wish I knew how it works. I can tell you this, not every Sasquatch can do this, and there are degrees of this ability. Some can do this long distance, some can't. Some can only do it while you're close by. Some can hear or read your thoughts but can't send theirs back to you. It appears that it is a genetic thing in them and in us. Some of us can send and receive thoughts and some can't. 
Try to see our brains as a radio. We may or may not be able to pick up signals or transmit. Each brain may be tuned to a different station on the dial. I've also discovered that when our brains go into a delta wave pattern, they are more easily accessible to this phenomenon. Because of this, these beings can infiltrate your dreams. I know this is crazy, but at least some of them can't. I promise you'll get emails from people who speak of dreams that don't seem like a dream that has one of these beings in it who is conveying some type of message. They can also do something like this to animals. Some have the ability to connect to the eyes of another creature and see through them. As nutty as this sounds, pay attention to the birds of prey. They will use the eyes of birds of prey to spy on people who are in their lands, especially owls. They can do this to people too. The difference is you will know it when it happens. You may not be able to explain what it is happening, but it is something you will be aware of. It is very rare they do something like this because it's a rather, it's rather disrespectful. So I bet you're wondering, why doesn't this mind speak thing happen more on people with encounters? Very simple. Sasquatch can't do it. You can't, the Sasquatch can't do it. You can't pick up on it. Or they don't want to. I've seen enough of this to develop a profile of people who should be able to communicate with them in this manner. The more of these qualities you have, the greater the chance you can actually communicate with the Sasquatch in this way. I've discovered that people who fit this profile are very secretive about their lives. They learned at a young age that people will think you have a mental issue. I've learned to spot them rather easily by asking the right questions in the right way. So far, I've only met one man who fits my profile versus enough women I can count on both hands. Why is this profile important? Because so many people end up with these beings coming around their homes or they keep having encounters with them and they are terrified about it. Many times the reason they are coming around them is because they put off some type of vibe that Sasquatch have. It's like a moth to a flame. The idea of one putting, of us putting out a signal like that, like they have, attracts them. It doesn't mean they want to harm you. It means their curiosity is off the charts. In some cases, if they discover you as a child, they will tag you. No matter where that person goes or how long they live, they will always be able to find you. It's like putting a transmitter collar on an animal. If you know the frequency, you can find it anywhere. This type of scenario is often them wanting to open a dialogue, so to speak. They will also do this to you if they actually like you. I hate to explain this, but I suspect that maybe the issue with you. You have spent so much time in the wild places alone, they respect you. You may be tagged. No matter where you are, they can find you. I've even picked up from your videos that you can sense their presence. I can too. It's a hard feeling to describe, but I call, I can sense them wherever, whenever they're around. That happened after an intense encounter with one individual who figured out I was no longer afraid of them. They are like that. They will often keep testing your nerves to see how you hold up. If you learn how to control your fear, you are no longer a dangerous man. I think you may have passed that test. So here's the profile developed. Once again, the more of these you have, the greater the chance that you can communicate in this unique way. Number one, women. Seems the vast majority of people who can mind speak are women. Number two, grew up in a rural or semi-rural environment. Number three, as a child, play, as a child played in wild places often alone even at night, exploring woods, prairies, and rivers and streams. Number four, loves animals, especially horses. Number five, Native American heritage in some form. Number six, chronic illness, things like asthma, etc. Number seven, family history of being gifted or psychic, for lack of a better word. Gifted people can come in all sorts of varieties, people who can sense energies or entities and so forth. As crazy as all this sounds, I want people to know the vast majority of these beings do not want to hurt or harm us. I've come to understand that if they really wanted to, they could really mess you up without even touching you, let alone looking at one. This is why it's important to leave whenever you have a strange feeling come over you. I had an encounter with one who was angry about humans hunting deer. He thought we were wasteful, leaving the gut pile after a kill. I walked into his field of anger. It felt like I walked into a highly charged electrical field. It went away after I had to explain to him that it, we as people typically do not eat the organs. Steve the Sasquatch are a people with a culture and belief system different than ours. Really no different than any other people group around the world. Just like us, they have divisions and disagreements within their own communities. Therein lies the problem. Some hate us, some don't. Some are criminals and most are not. One thing they do have in common is a culture. We are their biggest threat. That is what holds them together as a people. This is the common thread that keeps them cohesive, a common enemy, so to speak. Nothing unites and confronts a people more than having a common enemy. 
Imagine their perspective of us. Some of them see the worst of humanity. They watch us go into their home and dump garbage, kill animals for sport. They will see us rape our women and kill and dump the bodies in remote places, only to have hordes of our people flight into their areas looking for these victims. Where I am from, the forested areas are littered with used condoms, trash, needles, broken glass. Imagine stepping on discarded fish hooks along the rivers and streams. Can you blame the ones who hate us when they are exposed to this? On the other hand, there are places where they watch our families and children interact or us playing with our dogs, picking up trash, hunting responsibly. Those Sasquatch see us more like them, and because of that, we'll act accordingly. You once mentioned why dogs are terrified of them. That's not entirely true. Sasquatch that live around people who let dogs run with reckless abandon tend to hate them. In areas where we are more responsible with them, they can actually be just as friendly towards them as we are. I know two people who have witnessed one of them petting their dogs and the dog wagging their tails as they did. I know all this must be a lot to take in. It all sounds like insanity, I know. I can tell you this, I discovered that my sister and one of her four daughters can communicate with them in this strange manner. They never knew it. I just applied what I discovered with this profile I developed and tested them in the field where I knew individual Sasquatch. The bad thing all about this, you can't really prove who or what is speaking to you. That is what's dangerous about it all. I know Scott Carpenter's view. I have shared a few emails with him regarding these things. My view is a bit different. I'm well versed in the history of humankind. We're the most dangerous creature on the planet when we are frightened. Because of this, I give the Sasquatch the benefit of the doubt when it comes to their abilities. We as a people have a history of persecuting and destroying what we do not understand and are frightened by. I really think this is why the government lies and hides this from us. It only takes one mentally unstable person who thinks Sasquatch are demons to light a match and throw it on a forest floor and say it's doing God's will. If the government admits to the reality of these beings, then they will have to admit to all the things they are keeping from us. I really hope this is of use to you and the people who are listening. One thing I forgot to mention, this mind speak thing, do not trust anyone who says they speak to them in a sense that the Sasquatch is speaking with an English degree from Harvard. They keep things simple, and it's never complex. You often have to change the syntax to their sentences, for example. If you had a vicious dog and they asked you via mind speak about your dog, they would phrase it like this. Your dog mean kill chase deer. Do not like. Do not run. We will kill. You have to translate it to this. Your dog is out of control running deer and killing them. We won't tolerate this. Stop your dog from doing this or we will. I hope this makes sense and answers some questions for people who are troubled by this. Do not be afraid. Just accept the fact that we have a different version of ourselves living in the wild places we frequent. Always speak out with your voice if you suspect you have one nearby. Tell him, it's generally the males who confront us, I'm not here to hurt or harm you, just leave me alone and please go in peace. You'll be shocked at how well this is received. Imagine hating a whole race of people and one, and one actually speaks out to you wishing you peace. It has an effect. I'm not saying it always works, but this is what you try first. If you're overwhelmed with fear and can't control it, just leave. They escort you out, not because they're hunting you, they're just making sure you get the message and leave. Sincerely, the Owl Man. All right, okay, Owl Man. Um, and I appreciate that you wrote in. I appreciate all that knowledge you shared with us, and I appreciate you admitting that you had to eat a big pile of crow. Absolutely appreciate that. Thank you very much. Now... Uh, one thing that stood out in that volley was that you boldly stated that they commonly use the eyes of other animals to see. Um, that's a pretty bold statement, man. And for you to just boldly, blatantly make that statement to us, or to me, just personally, and I always say to everybody, don't jump on my bandwagon, don't jump on how I feel about things. All right? Everybody picks and finds the missing piece to their puzzle. So that statement about them seeing through the eyes of wildlife, personally, I have an absolute hard time accepting that one. I just do. You know, somebody forwarded me a, a picture, a video from somebody online who's got a Bigfoot Sasquatch channel and, and they had a gray jay, a skipjack hanging around them on the tree. And he blatantly said, look, the Sasquatch is looking at me through this bird right here. They do it all the time with this bird. <laughs> like, meanwhile, it just kind of made me roll my eyes, obviously, and of course, because obviously those gray jays are, 
The Grey Jays follow us around non-stop normally. They're opportunists. They know who can potentially supply food for them via scraps or even hand-fed, and they do it all the time, no matter how remote you are or near where there's human beings. The Grey Jays skipjacks just do that. I've had them in my videos hanging around me. And uh, I just find that when I, if you could email me back more details on how you obtained the information to boldly say that they commonly use the eyes of other animals to see. Now, if they had that skill, would it not be possible that they would allow us to use their eyes to see and transfer that view over to us? Maybe, possibly, I don't know. But I would think if any being had the absolute skill to use the eyesight of another living animal, completely different species as them, however many hundreds of yards away or miles or feet or whatever they have you, if they have the skill to do that, I would imagine they also have the skill to transfer their eyesight over to us if they felt like it. Maybe. Right? It's a huge thing to for anybody to wrap their head around that one point. But many of the points you made sound like they definitely may fit. Hopefully there's possibly other people out there who are in the same position as you are with experience with these beings and they might want to share or add to what you just shared with us. And uh, we'll keep the, keep the information at the round table going around equally and evenly, nonstop. But anyway, I can see another vehicle way off in the distance with some anglers getting their gear on. Parked right beside my truck. <laughs> so I think that I'm going to possibly get up and go up to that real good run there that I want to fish first. Unless, of course, I can find one more on here that might just take me a few minutes to read. Oh, this one I might be able to do. Let's try this one more, you guys. Booger and Cat. Hey Steve, thanks for what you do and how you do it. I'll try and be short. In October 1980, I was visiting my girlfriend at the time at Western Carolina St. St. University. She was on a gymnastics scholarship and has Saturday AM practice. So I left when she did for practice to go walk the mountain. Her injured teammates in her dorm, my first visit for a week earlier, to turn me into a taxi and I barely had enough dollars for gas to get back to my college on Sunday in Georgia. So after one hour or so walking on the side of the mountain, I heard a whistle very close. So close, I looked where it came from. I saw 30 feet up the tree what I thought was a giant gibbon ape. A family in my hometown had a pet gibbon, and judging from the length of the arms, this was one. It had to be too big to cradle, and the family released it. I had no idea how big a gibbon did or didn't get. I've since found out it's the smallest ape. It was at least my size or larger. 5'10", 220 squatted in a tree so just guessing black hair and charcoal face it had a look of surprise to see me it looked very healthy and youthful we were 50 feet apart so i got a good look like it was well fed we looked at each other maybe a minute and i left the only time it moved was when i did i moved to my left check for a tail it moved to its left behind center of the tree no tail just a fanny never threatened or felt threatened i know not exciting but what i saw and it was 10 years before I knew what it really was. Fast forward, fast forward 21 years, 2001, spring before 9-11. My brother and I were going flat fishing on Florida Big Bend area at 3.30 a.m., pulling 19-foot skip behind a pickup on a narrow state through National Forest 20 miles into North Florida out of Georgia. I was running 45 to 50 miles per hour with my high beams on looking to avoid hitting deer. A very large black cat ran right to left 20 inches in front of the truck and right and turned right at the shoulder and ran in my high beams for seven or eight seconds the patch spot pattern was clear and this was a black jaguar and it was massive not just long but massive 300 pound type muscle mass if i had seen a if i'd not seen a jaguar spot pattern i'd say someone painted a tiger black and it was that large it was a male because it was running away from me and i got a good look at body parts the tail was massive my brother said that thing could put my head in its mouth, and it could have. It finally veered left and went into the jungle. So after you talked about black cats, I thought I'd share that encounter with my brother and I had. That encounter that my brother and I had. Thank you again for pursuing what's really important. I'm sick of governments lying about a lot of stuff. I'm really sick of censorship. The worst lying. 
still working so. Thanks, Eddie. That's crazy, Eddie. Thanks for that email, man. Appreciate it. And uh, the large cat. <laughs> you know, the large cat in the, that size description is pretty impressive. But straight up, the amount of large cat sightings across North America that are absolutely ridiculous sounding happen all the time. People are reporting hyena type things all the time across North America. Recently, I've had people in British Columbia, Ontario, Michigan, I think Kentucky, have all wrote in about a wolf looking canine whose shoulders are higher than the hood of their pickup truck and upwards around five, 600 pounds. That's pretty impressive, right? And uh, when you have numerous people around North America, re unrelated to each other, reporting in the exact same thing right down to the fine detail of what they saw and scared the living shit out of them, we better start listening, right?